Hey everyone, my name is Brody Wilkes with Frontiersman Self-Reliance and I was asked by a friend, uh, Dave Whipple, who was also a participant on Alone Season 4. Uh, you know, he asked me to answer eight questions and this is something that was got, that got passed along to him and it was just interesting. It kind of gives uh, a little more, you know, of what people's backgrounds, you know, how to, what's their take and their approach to things, uh, particularly to, um, I, I'm going to say, kind of bushcraft mainly and, you know, taps a little bit into survival. So I'm just going to go through these eight questions. Uh, I want to say thank you to Dave for, um, you know, choosing me as someone to, you know, to answer these questions. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think they're, I, I think it's pretty good. I, I'm really am interested to see uh, other people's answer to these questions because even listening to Dave's answers, everybody everybody's going to have a little bit different approach to this. So I'll go ahead and get right into it. Uh, question number one: My most memorable camp. Uh, that's that's a pretty pretty significant one for me. And mainly because the camp, the first thing that comes to mind is a place that I no longer have access to. Uh, it was on my grandfather's land that has now been sold. Um, you know, it was that was my my father. You know, his you know his parents. And my my father had six siblings, and so what happens? You know, when my grandparents passed away, and they just kept it in the family for a long time. Uh, but then eventually they decided to sell the land. And what was so significant about that place is it was really unique in the fact that it was really a great hunting piece of property. It, it, was, a, it was farmland and my grandpa had, he originally was a sharecropper on that land and eventually bought it from the landowners. Um, but you know, you had some fields, but it was kind of, uh, on towards the edge of the property it was kind of more of kind of swamp land like river swamp um, you know area there and that was the area that I really enjoyed to to camp in I, I would I would you know park up by the house and I would pack my, you know my stuff back there and even though you know my grandparents and, and you know all my dad and all his family uh, they grew up on the river. There's a river there. It's called the Bogachitta River, and it's a pretty decent sized river. It's, it's it's wide, but it's kind of shallow. But you know, you could run a boat on it. They grew up just living on that river. I mean, they were like Native Americans, just living living there on the water. Um, just spent a lot of time there. And even though that was long before I was ever even old enough to go do something like that, I enjoyed camping on this piece of property and I would actually travel back to the river um, and, and you know and, and spend a lot of time on the river and, and to this day I still try to spend time on that particular river uh, just because I like it so much um, but that that camp it just I think it's mainly because of the seminal you know sentimental value of just being uh, on, on the family land on my grandparents land and and also the fact that I don't have access to it and one, one thing that was really unique about it is you know back when my 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 dad and, and you know and his you know parents and stuff when they were spending a lot of time back there they had access see their the land didn't go all the way to the river but they had access from the other landowners to access the river well I never had that so even though I was camping on my grandfather's land I had kind of secret pathways that I would travel to that river and was, I never disturbed anything. No, and I was even careful. I never left a footprint. I mean, nobody ever knew that I was there and, you know, I could go back there on the river and it was, it was thick on the river and it was really, I would go to places where, um, no one was going to walk up or typically what the easiest thing is, is because it's kind of, away from any type of home sites, people drive. So you may have an access point where somebody would drive a vehicle or four wheel or something. I just stayed away from those areas and those, and people never knew I was there and I could fish in the river and stuff like that. And it was great. Um, so that without a doubt is the most memorable camping spot. And I, I, 
you know, I learned a lot there. And, and, and the funniest thing, you learn how to be really stealthy too, because when you don't want to get caught, um, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm telling on myself here, but it's, you know, it's true. So definitely the most memorable. Uh, if I had opportunity, if there's any place I could go back, I would want to have access to that land. And, and I'd probably do it the same today. I'd probably still take my pathways of following these drainages and stuff going to the river. Um, question number two, camp alone or in a group? My best memories with camping have always been with other people. Uh, so when you do something and are, you know, whether it's hunting trips or, or, or anything, uh, when you have someone to share it with, it's always meant a little more. Uh, I do try to take uh, several trips, you know, at least two trips a year by myself. But what I do find is if I go by myself, I need to have some type of activity. If, and that means particularly I like to either be hunting or, fin or fishing. Um, if I don't have something like that, I get bored extremely bored if I don't have something to dedicate my time to so that that that's kind of the the gist of that is um, I don't I don't typically go off unless I'm say I, I've got somewhere I want to go fishing and stuff I don't have a problem going to camp and doing it by myself uh, I'm a very active person and so for me to sit around a camp and just have to find stuff to do is is almost miserable I mean it, it's I like to, to get up and have activities and, and be moving around. Really, I, I, stay, I stay really active. Even in the woods, I stay really active. Question number three, favorite knife? That's a, that's a tough question. Uh, I think that, you know, I, I have, a, you know, I've got a whole, the whole, I couldn't hold all my knives in, in two hands, you know, it's just one of those things, you just got a bunch of knives. So if I had a favorite knife, why do I have so many knives? Um, but I, I did I did narrow it down to, to three, and the reason that I narrowed this, you know, I was able to do that is because these are my three most used knives. Um, the the first knife is is a Bark River. It's a Gunny Hunter. Um, Bark River knives are really good quality knives. Um, it's a carbon steel knife. It's actually it's an A2. I mean, it, it's a decent knife. I like it. Uh, it nice leather sheath, um, left-handed sheath. That's a that's I, I find that I, I do most of my knife work with my left hand, so I like to wear um, I like to wear my knife on the left side. So, kind of telling on myself, you know, that's where a lot of other knives may not make the cut. Is that if I couldn't wear it on my left side. I'm probably not going to wear it much at all. Um, the second knife is the Moore Garberg, which for as far as bushcraft and stuff, I'd say this is my number one pick. Fantastic knife, very well made. It's a stainless knife. Mora uh, planned it where you can wear this left-handed or right-handed. So this is really would suit anybody. I've got a lot of use in, you know, with this knife. I, I've I've used it a lot. This is a really multifunctional knife. Um, so, really like this knife. But my number one pick, of, and it's mainly because this is my most used knife. Um, and actually, I had to take this knife off just to, to show you in this video. But I bought this leather sheath. It does not come with this. Um, but this is the Moral Companion. It's stainless. That's a fifteen-dollar knife. Um, you know, you're going to spend you're going to spend more than that on the on the leather sheath. But to wear it left-handed, that's what I did. I really, really like these companion knives. I've I have several of these. At fifteen dollars, I mean, you just you don't just buy one. I've given numerous of these away to friends as gifts. Um, they all love them and I have lost these knives before I, I have actually um, <laughs> I had a, one I lost in a canoe one time I mean it just but it's a $15 knife and you don't get too heartbroken about it um, but the main thing 
the main thing really what I'll tell you is what I like in a knife is a Scandi grind and just about all these knives it, the, the, the Bark Rivers kind of has more of a flat grind but the two Moras are Scandi grinds and that Scandi grind is fantastic so that's what I'm really going to be drawn to is a knife with a Scandi grind where did I learn bushcraft skills well one thing I need to specify is bushcraft is really a newer term for me uh, you know that was something that I really learned about in the past you know 16 to 18 years because the things that I do in the woods go all the way back to my childhood but at that time I had no idea what the term bushcraft was and so but I mean I spent a lot of time in the woods and luckily I had a father that really got me connected to the woods through a lot of hunting and that that single activity hunting is what has kept me engaged in the woods all throughout my life so really the skills that I had learned throughout the years for most of my life were connected to some type of hunting activity so you know I'm hunting and I'm carrying a bag and maybe I make a camping trip out of it uh, we've taken you know boating trips like way up in the swamps and and you know camped and stuff and so hunting is what really tattooed the outdoors on me and so to really it's hard to specify where my you know these bushcraft skills now like I said there's a lot of things I learned and, and got the interest from you know being very young uh, doing this stuff but you I didn't really know all the proper techniques and didn't necessarily have someone to show me all the proper techniques uh, so I mean there was a time even back in the early 2000s I'll say about 2003 2004 um, I think the last trip I made with my friends uh, was in 2004. But we would take these canoe trips and we'd float down the river, and, and Bogachitta River actually, and we would camp out on the sandbars. And our thing was then was we would only allow a certain amount of gear. And, and I think back then we would only, from what I recall, I think it was three items. We would say there was three of us, and we would say three items per person. And that was all you could take on the trip. Like there was nothing else that we were taking on the trip at all. And so, I mean, back, so we were just trying to make trips and really trying to make it interesting by just to a degree making ourselves kind of suffer because we just wouldn't take all the gear that we really needed. And we would just take just what we felt was most important. And we would, you know, make trips out of it, you know, several day trips out of it. And so that was a good time. And like I said, the last I did that was probably, probably 2005, maybe 2004. No, it's actually, it's going to be a little, no, I take that back. Um, I think we did that all the way up to about 2009. Uh, yeah, I think it's about 2009 because one of my friends that, um, that was going with us on this trip. There's three of us, like I said. Uh, one of one of my friends got killed in a motorcycle accident, so we, we quit making those trips. Um, so, but the the last thing I want to touch about where I learned bushcraft skills is in the end uh, in the later years of being in, in my college years, I was living in a small city, and I didn't have immediate access to the outdoors. You know, like I said but I did have access to the internet. And that's where I became aware of this term bushcraft. And it was through YouTube. There's so much information on YouTube that, I mean, you can find, I can tell you, there are things, I mean, I can, I've taken advanced courses, uh, bushcraft courses. All that information that you're gonna learn in an advanced course is on YouTube, okay? You, you're just going someone, you're just going and paying somebody to, to make an agenda but honestly if you knew what the agenda was you could go look up all that information on youtube and and also in a course you're getting that one-on-one -on -one. um but you you can cover all the all the generic stuff and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of information one thing i will say is back in that time uh one name i'll throw out there and that's uh dave canterbury 
that's that's when I run across his earlier videos about the five C's. If I was going to tell you to look up anything, I'd tell you to look up the five C's of Dana, uh, Dave Canterbury's videos on that. That's where he's talking about the basic gear kit, and he's really on he's really on on target with that. Uh, he he's he, I, I agree. I mean, even to this day, I agree with those five C's. You know that five C mentality that he talked about. Um, he goes into the the then he goes up to a ten C. But when you go beyond the five C's, those other five that he's talking when he's talking about in the ten, that's kind of personal choice stuff. There, you know, that was that's kind of like his opinion. But those first five are the basics. I mean, that's kind of the generic stuff that, like, even through history. They find those generic things, uh, like even on a caveman or something like that, or you know, or the natives and stuff. So those five C's is really the the main which you want to focus in on. Um, so, like I said, a lot of your detailed information. Um, do you have the right format? Do you write using the right materials and stuff like that? You can find a lot of that stuff on YouTube. What's your favorite way to start a fire? And I think where this this question really try to goes in you know try to go into is you know what is your skill set? Do you have the ability to start a fire with a bow drill? Uh, the the question you know the answer to that is yes I do. Um, I, I've even I've gotten coals with a hand drill. Those are confident builders. Those are things that those are skills that you want to. To learn because you can take them with you anywhere um, you know so but when it comes down to what's my favorite method I mean that that's a uh, you know I've got a little bag here I carry pretty often I mean here you, I've got a ziplock bag and inside of this is another ziplock bag and inside of that ziplock bag is a lighter that is the first thing that I'm gonna go to um, whenever i need to start a fire the reason why is that you know i may like using the a bow drill but it's it's a it's a it's a confidence thing but it's not really practical because a lot of times i'm i'm not i'm going on a trip or something like and it's a hunting trip and fishing trip something like that i don't have to build a bow drill from scratch i mean you're looking at about two hours to build it from scratch from zero uh you're looking at about two hours Usually when I need a fire, I don't have two hours to dedicate to that. That's why the lighter is my number one choice. Um, and also, <laughs> I've got, I've actually got two ferro rods in here. Um, so, ferro rods are good. I mean, they're, they're, they're great. But, I mean, the, the lighter is without a doubt my number one choice. And, and I, I think that most people would find that they would agree with that. Next question. What's my most essential piece of gear? That's a hard, that's a hard question. But through my experience, I have found that there is one thing that is m most important to me. And that is the ability to get warm and stay warm now that now you can kind of take that and you can say well you know well that oh, well, he's talking about building a fire you can do that but that means that there's a lot of activity because you have to go gather wood and anytime i build a fire i mean it's throughout the night that fire is going to burn down and it's not going to be producing the same amount of heat um, and also in the climate I'm in, there's a lot of, a lot of rain. I mean, in fact, we were getting rain today. But my most essential piece of gear, which guarantees me that I can get warm and stay warm, is this. This is a MMS sleep system. This is the, the military issue. Um, It actually, it's, um, it, it actually has three parts. It's got a green bag, which is a warm weather bag, a black bag, which is the cold weather bag, or, and, and, it's, and also it has the bivy bag. 
So the, the thing about this is that it's, for me, this is the only sleeping bag I need to have because because of the, the the multiple bags i can use it in the warmer weather i can use it in colder weather or i can put them together and you can stack them and it's good to like negative 40 degrees so it's really good but really what makes this so important is this bivy bag it's got this gore-tex bivy bag that's on it and that thing works um and it, and if i if if the history channel and alone and that you know and their production company didn't have such foolish rules this would have been the bag i would have took on alone uh but because you know they don't they would they considered each one of those bags a separate item even though it's a system you know they consider the bivy bag an item and then each one of these bags would have been a separate item i would have been fine but i was like well i'm not going to use up two of my items just to take the green bag and the black bag so I wound up taking a different bag plus a bivy bag. And, but I know that this piece of gear, I, no matter where I'm at, it can be rainy. It can be just flooding on me. I can get in this bag, down in this bivy bag, and just I can lay on wet ground and I can get warm. I can get warm because this thing will protect me from the water. I mean, it, 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 I have so much confidence. I could lay in the rain. I could rain, lay, just rain, uh, lay a raincoat over my face. Just because that's the, because when you zip this thing up, that's the only access point you have. Uh, so you can really stay dry. I mean, but I could lay that over my face and just lay out in the rain. I'd be, I'd be fine. Um, in fact, when I was doing the hike on a loan, uh, I had a bivy bag and these the bivy bags actually made with uh when you lay in it the, the the zipper is on the side and the vegetation and stuff was so thick on vancouver island that i mean you if anything touched it immediately absorbed it and become soaking wet um you know, that vegetation is just like a sponge that i was sleeping with the zipper straight up on this bivy bag and never got wet i mean i was sleeping directly on uh, the wet ground like soaking ground like ground that was like a sponge sleeping directly on the ground I would turn you know, like I said the only thing I would because what happened was my zipper would get down and touch that vegetation and it starts absorbing water through the zipper so I turned that bivy bag where it's just straight up and, and you could I mean you could sleep in a puddle of water and still stay dry uh, so that's the most essential piece of uh, piece of gear because it has the ability to, to allow me to get warm. So with this, I don't necessarily need a fire, okay? It, and it's, and by the, with the, to get warm has a certain degree of comfort that comes along with it. But if you've ever been in a situation where it, you're freezing cold and you just haven't been able to get warm, and I mean, I've been in situations where my sleeping bag was not even closely uh, rated cold enough for the for the temperature and, and freeze all night the next thing you do is invest in something like this and you just make sure it never happens again but great piece of gear next question question number seven do you prefer alcohol wood or or a gas stove the only time that i don't cook over wood so if I'm if I'm packing my stuff in, or you know any type, I use I'm gonna build a, a fire and I'm gonna use a coal bed and I'm gonna cook over that. The only time that I don't cook over um, wood is if I have some means of bringing in my gear. And really, what I'm referring to is I've taken you know I take trips on the river, um, going in the swamp and being there for several days hunting. And we're in a boat and so with the uh, with that boat that's your pack mule so you have the ability to put something in there that i wouldn't normally carry with me if i was packing my stuff in because when i'm packing my stuff in i'm i'm leaving all that, that those kind of things out um but in the boat what i have found i've used the dual fuel uh stoves and i've used the propane out of those two, I prefer the propane. The propane is very consistent in the way it burns, 
and it uses the little one pound bottles and they've done a great job and and just it, it really it does good so if that's uh if, if that's something that that i can do is, is is put my gear and you know if i'm putting my gear in a truck or putting my gear in a boat i, I would be happy with a propane stove um, now i've seen people use these little like rocket stoves that i saw a guy he had one on his tailgate of his truck and i mean he cranked that thing up and put a cup up there and he made a little cup of coffee in, in just a few minutes and that was pretty impressive like i said i'm not really the guy to ask on the most modern uh gear options out there i, I just I'm, I'm gonna stick to the basic stuff but i will say you know that that guy's making a cup of coffee and i'm like hey man you think you can make me one next i mean it was it was pretty nice i was impressed with that thing um i have no idea what kind it was i didn't even look at it close enough so i was impressed with it but but I, I will still, I prefer cooking over wood. You know, if, if the option's there, I, I cook over wood. Uh, also, going in the boats and stuff on the hunting trips, a lot of times we're getting up really early, like before daylight. And because of the time it takes to, to get a fire stoked up and, and hot enough that you can cook on it, you can crank that propane or, or even a dual fuel. Uh, but it, like I said, I prefer the propane. You can crank that stove up and be cooking some eggs and bacon and be done in just a few minutes and you know in a fire you're still trying to get it hot so that that's why those type of stoves have been used in the past all right down to question number eight last and final question do i keep a bug out bag in my vehicle uh, the answer to that is no uh, the reason why is my best chance of survival first of all is my property so everything i i mean i have trees i mean everything i plant here i mean my wife knows what my you know my theme is and anything i plant on the property uh whether it's trees you know or plants or anything like that they have some type of edible or medicinal value uh, I, gardens and stuff so my best chance of survival is right here so having something a bug out bag so <clears throat> when i when i say bug out bag i have this image in my mind is that i am leaving and going to a safer place so the safest place i can be is on my own property and i have neighbors around me that share the same mentality and i can rely on them for security and stuff like that so it's the best place for me to be now the reason that if i was going to leave here would be something like a nuclear fallout where okay i'm no longer safe on my own property and i have to leave the, that doesn't change the fact of me having a bug out bag in my vehicle because i'm going to have those bags at my house because i have a wife and a two-year-old daughter that that i need to include in my you know in my expedition you know if i hey if i'm leaving i have to have them and so our meetup point is still our property. So we're gonna leave from here. I've got the bags I need in my home that I can grab those bags and put in my, you know, put in my truck and is really a much better kit than I could have in just one bag because I can make it, you know, four or five bags and really, really have everything I need. And also, you know, I have family that's close proximity and and so i need to include them if there's something that's a hazard and like i said if we've got to leave i need to include them in, in that you know in that plan so bug out bag uh in my vehicle is not really something I, I find is absolutely necessary now there is a piece of gear that i i do carry in my vehicle and i would suggest anyone to carry in your vehicle um because it's I think you have to identify what would be my immediate danger if I was away. And my, my immediate danger, I think, would be um, where I would be in, in, in harm's way. You know, where, where I would be in danger. You know, where somebody would be trying to harm me. Uh, so the kit that I would suggest anybody to have in their vehicle is this. And it is some type of firearm 
I mean, I don't care if it's a pistol or if it's a rifle or what, but this, this is something. This is an everyday carry piece of kit with me. Every day I walk out of my home, this is with me. So that, you know, that to me is the, the important, you know, essential piece of gear that, that goes with me. So that pretty much covers it. That, that, that covers all the eight questions. Um, that, that, so hopefully that kind of gives an idea of, you know, a little bit of, you know, my thoughts on things and, you know, you know, you got to see the whole pictures to kind of understand where I'm coming from. But I think everybody, um, kind of has a little bit different background. So, so your answers to this, you know, to this is going to be a little bit different. If I lived in a city, my answers to this would be totally different. Like my last, like that number eight, like, do I have a bug out bag in my vehicle? Probably because my house or apartment in a city is not necessarily going to be a safe place at that moment. And I have witnessed um, whenever the time comes and you have to evacuate, um, you know, these cities. You know, and I, I see that every year when it comes to a hurricane that's coming to our area, you have these cities that are evacuating. That's not even a great situation to be in. I mean, they get, I'm talking about, it becomes bumper to bumper, like the slow roll kind of thing going down the interstate in areas where there's like nothing. Like, I'm talking like, you would be 40 miles away from the city limits and these people are still in a slow roll, like doing 10 miles an hour kind of stuff. It is kind of insane. So uh, there, so there are several of those things that would be um, be a little bit different if, if I lived in the city. And and I think that the mentality is that living where I do live, uh, my focus is on self reliance. But if I lived in the city, my focus would be on bug out. And and because you don't you don't really have all the means necessary uh, for self reliance. And so, anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. And you know, once again, thank you, Dave, for uh, choosing me to answer these questions. I really appreciate it.